Hello and welcome to this talk. Now in today's video we want to welcome back a rather wonderful doctor, a paediatrician called Dr. Ros Jones. She's been on the channel before and she's been speaking in a forum called Fertility in Crisis with the Lighthouse Declaration. Um, but here she talks, she gives an overview of the complete debacle that was the COVID vaccine. If you can bear to listen to it, she's absolutely brilliant. She nails every point precisely. And we're going to listen to her now. Just for goodness sake, give her the time because it really explains so, so much. Give her the time. She's absolutely fantastic. Just before we do that, of course, we want to pay tribute to the life of um, Charlie Kirk. Sadly, tragically, Utah Valley University, he was murdered. Mr. Kirk leaves behind a wife and two children. Our thoughts and prayers go to his uh, friends and family. No doubt in my mind that Mr. Kirk could have been a future leader of the free world. Over now to uh, Dr. Jones and the Lighthouse Declaration. So, Dr. Jones, I uh, the first thing that I wanted to ask you is this question that people have about whether or not the COVID vaccines, and particularly the mRNA technology-based vaccines, are the same sort of animal as other vaccines that have been used in children um, and even in adults as well. Can you maybe start us off with that and then take us through some of your uh, concerns and why you're here on this panel? I should say, first off, that I'm retired, as you said, and I think that's given me a unique situation of not only having the time, but also not having anybody trying to tell me that I cannot say what I need to say. And I have colleagues who've been censored and risk losing their jobs. So I think censorship has been a, a loss of debate and discussion about things has been really unfortunate for women because they haven't got the information at their fingertips and it's all been presented as if there's a consensus and everybody agrees that these products are wonderful. So there are some phrases you weren't allowed to use. You weren't allowed to say novel technology. You weren't allowed to say gene-based vaccines. And there is a fundamental difference. So briefly, when you get a standard, let's say you have hepatitis vaccine, they will give you a bit of protein from the hepatitis B virus. Or you might have a virus that's been killed or, or weakened, inactivated in some way. And then you're given so many micrograms of that product. And then your body makes antibodies to that from your immune cells, you get rid of this foreign protein because you, you recognize it's not yours, it, it shouldn't be there. And then you build a memory so that if you meet that virus again, you can immediately make antibodies quickly and get rid of it before it causes an illness. And that's the sort of theory. Now, what we've done here is we've taken a bit of genetic material and it doesn't matter, there's the AstraZeneca Johnson & Johnson style, they were DNA and the Pfizer and Moderna are RNA, but the principle is the same. It's a genetic piece of code from the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it then has to find some way of getting it into your body's cells so that it makes your own cellular mechanism create the spike protein. Instead of just giving you the spike protein, we're giving you the tools to make it yourself. And it sounds frightfully clever. People are very impressed. But the trouble with that is that it's got no off switch. If you have any new drug or vaccine, the first thing you have to do is work out the exact right dose to give, where it goes in the body, how long it lasts for, whether that's different for adults or children or in pregnancy. But for these products, we're five years on and they still can't tell us actually where it goes in the body, how much spike protein individuals make, how long they go on making it for. And we were told it would just stay in the arm, which was clearly ridiculous. And unfortunately, for some people, obviously not for most people, but some people go on and on making spike protein. So if you get an adverse effect to most drugs, when you stop taking the drug, the adverse effect goes away. But for this, you can't make it go away if you're one of the people who continues to make spike protein. 
And the way they got it to go into the cells, the Pfizer and Moderna, they wrapped it in a little lipid fatty envelope called lipid nanoparticles, which were designed to cross cell membranes. And so instead of just staying in the muscle, it wasn't really designed to. It was designed to get into cells. It can cross all the membranes. It can go into your brain. It can go into your heart. It can go into your ovaries, your testes. The problem then is that when you're making this stuff, it's got to get back out again to be recognized and make antibodies. But you're then going to fight that. So you're fighting your own cells in the process. So it was predicted right from the word go that it would cause a lot of autoimmune inflammatory type side effects. And that has, in fact, turned out to be the case. So when it comes to safety, the regulatory system was flawed from the beginning because all new drugs go through a proper regulatory system. But vaccines have got a shortcut system because we've had vaccine technology for decades. So it's assumed that, let's say, you've already got a safe vaccine for pneumococcus, and then you think, let's make it for a different bacteria. So you use the same technology and just swap the bug that you're making the vaccine for. It's assumed to already be safe. So it just bypasses most of the testing. And certainly Pfizer and Moderna, they thought that this was going to be a gene product. And that's what they were anticipating. And in fact, the WHO started doing draft guidelines for new regulatory system for these totally new products. And then people were in such a rush, they just said, oh, don't let's bother with that. Let's just use the vaccine approval system. So I've seen the approval papers and where it comes to things like there's a one called genotoxicity, which is does it affect fertility, for example? It just says not applicable. And then teratogenesis, whether it affects the embryo if you were given it during pregnancy, not applicable. Carcinogenesis, could it make you get cancers? not applicable. So all of those tests have been totally bypassed. So yes, in my career, I have always recommended lots of vaccines, and I've had lots of vaccines, but I wouldn't go near any of these with a barge pole for myself, even as somebody in my 70s, let alone mm. recommending it for healthy, young people who were not at any particular risk from COVID. So just again, briefly, you're always looking with any drug at balance of benefit and risk. So if you take a disease that has a very strong correlation with age and comorbidities, which this did, and we knew that right from the beginning, that it had an average age of death of 18 plus, so older than average age of death in most of the countries that compared. So you can't get much benefit from a vaccine if you're giving it to young, healthy people who were never going to get ill in the first place. And then we also got, ironically, the sort of side effects we've been seeing are worse in younger people, probably because they have a more efficient Im immune system, maybe because they make more spike protein for longer. I have no idea why, but several of the side effects that were found quite early on, the blood clotting side effects, cardiac inflammation, myocarditis, were commoner the younger you were. And therefore, the, the balance of risk got even more skewed. First off, there's not much benefit because you weren't going to get ill. Then there's worse side effects. So your, your balance is completely skewed. So that's where I started out from. But obviously, as a neonatologist, I was also particularly aware of the risks of giving these vaccines in pregnancy. Sure. No, I, I totally relate to your comment about the, the risk benefit. And that's true also, by the way, for economic policy or social policy more generally. You, you get effects that are positive and that are negative from a lot of different policies that governments can undertake. And certainly during the lockdown period, what I was worried about was that that risk benefit ratio was not in favor of health, uh, that the lockdowns were going to cause more damage than they delivered benefits. And, uh, and so this is a very parallel sort of situation. Uh, Dr. Jones, I just wanted to ask, it seems that that it was a bit unusual for the marketing campaign for the trials to be so aggressively targeted to the youth, particularly the AstraZeneca trials, when, as we've discussed, the youth were not really at risk. So can you speak about that a bit? Well, yes. We, I was very surprised to see them advertising for children to join a trial um, on the early evening news. And I wrote straight off to the lead investigator to query why they were doing this when they hadn't yet got any adult safety data. And he replied to my amazement saying, you're quite right, we don't know about safety in children. And effectively, that's why we're doing the study. And also Pfizer and Moderna are doing studies in children. So obviously we have to as well, as if that made it all right. 
and there was no consideration of the relative risks to youth of of how low COVID was as a, as a threat to youth health. I wanted to ask you specifically about what your thoughts were about the aggressive marketing that we saw for children and young people to get these vaccines who, as you say, you know, were not particularly at risk. Yes, I would say in my entire career of seeing new vaccines coming in over decades, I've never seen anything like this. We were having people being offered pizzas and Uber rides. We were having pop-up clinics set up at one of our big theme parks um, near London and, and, and football stadia. There was one football stadia in London where they were offering a thousand free tickets for the football for the first thousand to turn up to get their vaccines. I even found myself walking away from a Westminster Abbey coffee shop was giving you a discount on your coffee if you could produce your vaccine certificate. You know, it was just beyond belief, to be honest. And particularly the other thing for children was the pushing children to get vaccinated to protect adults. And that, again, to my mind, you know, we always sort of put women and children first. And there's a reason biologically, if you want the species to continue, you have a reason for putting women and children first. But the idea that we would expect children to protect elderly adults a, it didn't work because we knew very early on that the vaccine actually was never tested for and indeed failed dismally to prevent infection and transmission, even if it may have reduced your risk of severe illness. But B, even if it had worked, is that really ethical? I certainly wouldn't want one of my grandchildren to have risked getting heart damage for the sake of giving me an extra year or two on the planet. I've had my three school year and ten. I'm not entitled to more at anybody else's expense. And no, it's completely against Nuremberg, Helsinki Agreement. All the codes of conduct are that for children, and that's why for pregnancy in particular, because there you've got an unborn baby who cannot give informed consent at all. So the mother has special protections as well. And for children, because they cannot give consent themselves, they've always been in a situation that we expect any drug, whether in research or in clinical practice, has to be for that patient's own benefit and not for the benefit of society or answering scientific questions. Yeah, totally. I think that's uh, that's a very important reminder that whenever you're getting a medical intervention, it's it's a bit of a slippery slope when one starts arguing about total societal benefit. Um, but there is, of course, something that's society wide that has been important in medical science and particularly in vaccination science in the past, which is natural immunity. So when somebody has natural immunity um, and other people have a lot of it, you can develop this sort of herd immunity, and then that's considered to be defensive. That decisions about about who should get vaccinated against COVID. So it didn't seem to matter whether someone had been exposed to the virus and had recovered, and then presumably had some degree at least of natural immunity. That seemed irrelevant, at least in some countries, to the decision about whether or not they should get the vaccine. Can you comment a little bit about that? Because to me, that seemed a bit confusing. Yes, I mean, to me, that was a, a very big red flag, really. I mean, we were rolling out vaccines to primary school children at a time when our Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation acknowledged that 90% of them had already had it. I heard our Chief Medical Officer being questioned in Parliament by a, an MP who is also a paediatrician, and she was saying to him, shouldn't we at least test the children and then only vaccinate the ones that haven't had it? And he said, oh, that would be much too complicated. But that's what we did for tuberculosis vaccine. I mean, I had a skin test at, at school to see, age 12, whether I needed a BCG vaccine or not. We could have perfectly well got children to do a spit test and looked for an anti antibody then and there and said, no, go back to class if we'd wanted to, but we didn't want to. Um, and it was argued for quite a long time that natural immunity wouldn't last. Well, if it wouldn't last, then the vaccine wouldn't work. Coronaviruses, you don't get lifelong immunity, but what you get when a new coronavirus is around, you get more so people being a bit sicker the first time around, and then you just get recurrent common colds, unless you're very vulnerable, in which case that may make you ill again. But for most people, you're just going to get a cold, and that, that immunity is fine. It's absolutely good enough. 
Yeah, I mean, one of the things I was thinking at the time when we were saying that we we wanted to protect the elderly, which was, of course, true, was that, well, one way to do that is to generate immunity quickly in the young who were not particularly vulnerable to death from COVID. So just expose people to the virus, get people you know who are young and not as likely to go down with it to be the ones who are most likely to be exposed. And of course, our policies ended up producing a world in which the opposite happened, where the, the more vulnerable you were, the more likely you were to be be exposed to COVID. And that was often because people were in aged care settings or other institutionalized settings, uh, hospitals. Yeah. And, and of course, the COVID uh, virus was, you know, would get in there and then circulate and, and infect everyone, whereas a lot of young people had to stay home inside and look at the wall <laughs> instead of being exposed to COVID. Yeah, I was certainly involved when I was working at, as Director of Women and Children's Services and um, was involved in the pandemic planning for before the um, avian flu in you know 15 years ago and lockdowns were never they just weren't on the agenda at all they were no. never mentioned in any discussions we had whatsoever and they were not going to be done um anywhere until sort of mid-march they suddenly you know we got several weeks into this before anybody mentioned lockdowns and then yeah. suddenly the whole, world, the whole world were doing the same thing at the same time which again was a little bit odd yeah, no, we could have a long conversation about the lockdowns and uh, and and just that whole period. Um, so I guess, yes, a, a question to reflect on for ourselves and our audience is why it was that the normal sorts of safety standards and transparency were sidelined for a new vaccine, particularly when this vaccine or the several ones that were developed for COVID were basically being presented to groups that weren't particularly at risk of the disease and being pushed in those groups. Uh, do you think that that speed of production was one of the reasons why we went for the mRNA technology rather than more of a traditional vaccination technology like you were describing before? It is said to be quicker. But having said that, that's been really problematical because it was quick to produce a purified version. Once they got this genetic code from China, it was really amazingly quick that they were able to replicate this in the laboratory. But when it came to rolling it out to millions, they went for a completely new production mechanism. And actually, again, that's been very worrying because all the trials were carried out using a purified lab-made version, um, sort of totally synthesized through um, PCR um, type technology. But the one that went out to the public was based on great big vats of E. coli bacteria, which are then using DNA. It's, it's a complicated, but it basically getting the DNA incorporated into the bacteria to then make the RNA to go into the lipid. And we've there have been quite a number of labs now that have shown this DNA contamination in the commercial vaccines. Um, and that has potential for a lot of, of problems. And it there are li there are limits that have been set and in the past because it's, it's, it's technology that's used for standard vaccine production um, and they are allowed to have tiny amounts of dna left behind but a while ago they suddenly increased the limit i think tenfold at least from picograms to nanograms but also they haven't taken account of the fact that it's been wrapped in these tiny lipid particles so it's designed to go into cells whereas the dna that might come in an ordinary vaccine and would just get cleared very quickly but this won't because it's going straight into your cells so the potential for it to actually integrate into the patient's own dna is 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 possible and we've got not good we've not got good evidence that it can't do that yeah um, 